I've had the, the blessing of knowing you as a family for couple for many years, and I'm continually impressed with who you are and how you do life. So I know you professionally. Um, Brendan's a child psychiatrist, and he's made a tremendous impact in our um, the broader psychiatry um, community, locally and internationally. And he's also impacted our own community with many of our own people having been treated and cared for by him. Brendan has also written so many peer um, journals for, and he's also a reviewer for um, Journal, African Journal of Psychiatry. Did I get the right one, mm. Brendan? So he's, he's excellent in what he does. And overseas, he's been asked to present at science uh, meetings. He's a common speaker in uh, schools, in churches, and I've often have had the privilege of sitting under his teaching to equip me and to get more from, from him for my journey of what I'm doing. Um, Brendan's written a book. What's all the fuss about ADHD? I think there's a brilliant name for a book around the controversy around that. He's been in the social media, he's written articles, he's chosen to influence the world with his knowledge for God's glory. And I know him personally, and I can say he's a great brother in Christ. And with his lovely wife, Debbie, they live their faith. Every day they walk it and they live their faith and they endeavor and strive to bring up their four children in godly wisdom. And we stand here, and we're gonna use the words from your two awards that you got when you at varsity. The one in postgrad and one in undergrad, and it was, um, I'm to get the, word, the names of them, Kurt Gibbs and Lewis Franklin Freed Awards. And it's for the most distinguished candidate so Brendan is the most distinguished candidate to come and talk to us today, to give us knowledge, to give us tools. And the idea is that we walk away in wisdom, that we take this knowledge and it doesn't sit here, but we put it into wisdom that brings forth kingdom and godliness. And we thank both of you for being here. Thanks. Paul. Evening, everyone. I'm just going to move this a little bit back, I think. Um, thank you, Paula, for that very generous introduction. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me to speak. Um, can I just ask by a show of hands, how many teenagers we've got here? So it's sort of 13 to 21. Who's, who here is 13 to 21? Wow, that's actually quite a nice chunk of the audience. That's great. It's complicated because when you speak to teenagers and parents, you, it's difficult to please both of them, right? So if I manage to do both, then I'll, I'll be happy. How many of you, by any chance, is anyone expecting a baby or you've got a child under the age of three? Not too many. Okay. <laughs> they are, they're probably all three. Okay. Um, so, so we're going we're gonna to kick off. <clears throat> um, please excuse me, I have been ill, so I'll be clearing my throat from time to time. Now, I'm going to show my age now. <clears throat> How many of you can remember when we first got TV in South Africa? <laughs> this is so exciting. 1976 or thereabouts. And I remember with my family sitting and watching the test panel. It was quite <laughs> riveting, actually, <laughs> waiting for something to happen. And on Tuesday nights, it was Afrikaans. You know, Tuesdays and Thursdays were Afrikaans. Monday, Wednesday, Friday were English, so we all learned much better Afrikaans because we were exposed to it more. Fast forward, I don't know how many, 50 years or so, now we have a ratio of four screens to one child rather than four people to one screen. And so we have an epidemic of screen exposure. And um, f for, f for what it's worth, there's some research done on the amount of time that children spend on screens in various countries. We don't have data for South Africa, but it's probably in, in the order of that. And the scary thing is during the COVID pandemic, that increased. And some studies suggested, if it's at all possible, that screen time, average screen time for recreational use actually doubled during the pandemic. And in fact, hasn't got back to baseline since the pandemic. So it seems like since COVID, we've kind of ushered in a new normal in terms of screen exposure. So, why is this a problem? 
And when thinking of the impact of excessive screen exposure on young people, we can think about it in two ways. We can think about the direct impact of that screen consumption on the developing brain. And we can also think about it in terms of what we would call the opportunity cost. In other words, what's not happening in the development of that person whilst they're sitting in front of an iPad. So to explain this, I find it often helpful to go chronologically. In other words, from the smallest child, um, from the baby, all the way through into adulthood. So thinking about it in terms of a very young child, what we know about small children is that their brains are developing extremely rapidly, such that if we look at the size or the weight of a newborn brain, it kind of trebles in size in the first two years of life. And after that, it actually doesn't get much bigger. So by the age of around about two or so, the brain is 80 or 90% of its final adult size. Now that doesn't mean that other changes aren't happening in the brain after that time, but it's really just to illustrate what a, what, what a rapid period of change we're dealing with in the first two years of life. And during that time, very important milestones are happening in the life of that infant, such as their uh, attachment to their primary caregiver, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, motor milestones, gross motor and fine motor, of course their cognitive and language development, their social development, and their emotional self-regulation. And because of that very rapid uh, change in the size of the brain, there's a concept called neuroplasticity. So we're going to talk a little bit about neuroscience tonight, so I hope you don't mind. Um, and neuroplasticity refers to how the brain changes its functional and structural connectivity with usage. In other words, the, 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 the brain isn't just a passive template, it actually changes with use. And so what we expose a small child to, especially in that period of rapid brain growth, affects the organization of the brain. And intensive usage can stimulate growth of new synapses or connections between cells and pathways, as well as eliminate those that are not used. So it's the, the so-called use it or lose it principle. And again, that's happening in a very uh, ac accentuated way in the first two years of life. And it's possible that because of that use it or lose it principle, that if the brain is exposed too much to one particular activity, that other important skills may be neglected or lost. So attachment, one of the very important milestones that's happening during this two year, first two years of, of the child's life, is really referring to the uh, process by which small children form close emotional bonds with their mothers, usually first, and, and then their fathers and the rest of their families. And the important thing about it is that it happens in a critical window period of around 24 or maybe 36 months of life. And then it kind of stops. So attachment either happens properly in those first two years of life or it doesn't. And healthy attachment requires these factors here, focused attention from the mother, sufficient eye contact, physical touch, mother tongue language stimulation, and a mother who is attuned to her infant's needs. And you can imagine, if you just look at that list of five important prerequisites for healthy attachment, that if screens are involved, either because mom is on Facebook while she's breastfeeding her child and these things happen, or because the child has been plonked in front of an iPad as a babysitter, that those things don't happen. And so it follows, and there's actually research on this, that when there's lots of screen, screens involved in the life of that infant mother partner, partnership, dyad, that insecure attachment is, an, is one of the outcomes of that, um, of that process. And insecure attachment itself has been linked to a whole lot of negative outcomes in later childhood, including poorer social functioning, poorer emotional self-regulation, poorer academic functioning. And those negative outcomes of insecure attachment persist. So there's been long-term studies that look at kids at the age of 15 or 18 
And those who've had insecure attachment from small um, persist with those, those deficits in their development even much later on in their lives. Another way that excessive screen time disrupts early development is through the lack of sleep. And uh, we know that excessive screen time is going to impact on the amount of sleep a young child gets. It's purely just, again, the opportunity cost. There's less time available for sleep. But also, many of you will know that electronic devices emit so-called blue wavelength light, which shuts down the brain's natural melatonin. And melatonin is a natural hormone that the brain produces, which helps us to fall asleep when it's dark. And so if we're in front of an iPad when it's bedtime, we're shutting down our natural brain's melatonin functioning and makes it harder for us to sleep. And the same for children. Again, thinking about the opportunity cost of excessive screen time is the reduction in exercise that happens when somebody's in front of a device. And certainly for very small ch children, that can impact on their early motor development, on their coordination. And interestingly, uh, exercise is the only lifestyle factor which we know of which has been shown to stimulate new cell growth or neurogenesis in an area of the brain called the hippocampus. But some of you will know that the hippocampus is a very important brain structure in memory. And so um, it's been shown that uh, regular cardiovascular exercise helps to stimulate new brain cell growth in the hippocampus. So cognitively, it's, uh, it, it explains the benefits of regular exercise. Um, yeah, I'm still on. The very important association is that between obesity and excessive screen time. And that's been well documented, and there are various theories why that is. Um, firstly, again, it makes sense. The more you're in front of a screen, the less you're exercising. So that could be one mechanism. Um, there's also some interesting research on how um, when you're viewing a screen, um, it actually disrupts your brain's natural mechanism of feeling full. So, you, you know, you're normally your brain s releases a hormone that tells you that you've had enough now. And it seems that when you eat in front of an, a, an electronic screen, it disrupts that mechanism of feeling full when you've had enough to eat. And then there's a, there's, there's a correlation also between sleep de deprivation itself and obesity. Uh, again, when people are sleep deprived, the appetite regulating hormones that the brain releases are disrupted. And uh, it seems that being fatigued also influences your food choices. So if you're tired, you're more, more likely to go for carbs than for health, healthier food choices. Um, and, and of course also, increased snacking and eating outside of normal meal times is likely to happen with excessive screen use. Oh, sorry. Now this is a very important piece of research which was conducted quite a long time ago. As you can see, it's around 20 years ago. Before we even had a lot of gaming and that kind of thing. But it was done with young children exposed to television. And uh, there's actually a wonderful YouTube clip uh, summarizing this research, which I'll show you on, on the last slide. Um, basically, what this pediatrician did, he took 1,000 preschoolers from the age of between 1 and 3. And this is a longitudinal study, so he, he looked at them all the way up into their uh, grade 1, grade 2 years. And what this group found was that for every hour of daily television exposure, at age three, there was a 10% greater risk of that child developing concentration problems at school-going age. Um, when they took that same group and looked at the kids aged four or five years old, there wasn't any necessarily greater risk of concentration problems. So again, it's showing us that critical window of development in that first two or three years of life, that if we do things wrong, then the consequences can be far-reaching. And so the hypothesis for this, and it's not 
anything that's been proven to date, is that early and excessive screen exposure somehow preconditions the brain to expect high levels of stimulation. And this next piece of research kind of corroborates that because if, because uh, they then stratified this for the type of content, the type of television content. If the content is purely educational, slow paced, Richard Attenborough talking about the life cycle of the frog in this kind of way, then there's no greater risk of, of um, later concentration problems. However, if as soon as it's entertainment, right, think Cartoon Network, um, I don't know what kids watch now, but it used to be Cartoon Network. You know, it's loud, it's bright, it's changing quickly. Then, then all of a sudden there's a 60% greater risk of later concert. And of course it goes without saying if the content is inappropriate, even greater risk. So not all screens are created equal and not all screen exposure is equal. Some stuff is much more benign than others. There's also evidence that excessive screen use can impair social or emotional intelligence. There seems to be a linear association between the amount of time spent on digital media and reduced empathy, poorer recognition of facial cues, social cues. And there's a couple of theories as to why that might be. The most obvious being that there's just less time for proper face-to-face -face interaction if you're behind an iPad all the time. But there's also some interesting research, for example, on adults who did a lot of Pokemon when they were younger. Um, seem to have, and this is uh, looking at brain imaging, seem to have changes in areas of the brain that are responsible for facial recognition. So I'm glad I didn't play Pokemon when I was younger. Now we're going to look a little bit at the addictiveness of screen use. And uh, I want to introduce you to a particularly important area of the brain. So that image you see is a, if you were to chop a brain from the top longitudinally and then look at, so you chop it into longitudinal halves and you look at it from the side. In the middle, in, in, as you can see represented by that little red dot, is a, a little area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And that's referred to colloquially as the pleasure center of the brain because it's that area of the brain that is stimulated by dopamine, which is a, 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 a nerve chemical, neurochemical, and through which we experience pleasure and euphoria. So when we are ecstatic, and there are different areas of our lives physiologically that can make us particularly ecstatic, dopamine hits the nucleus accumbens. It also so it happens to be the area of the brain that's stimulated by certain drugs of abuse, such as cocaine, for example. And it's also that area of the brain which is bombarded by fast-paced screen time, i.e. gaming. So gaming, and I, I really should substitute excessive screen use for, for gaming because it's, it's really got to do with fast-paced screen time. Uh, uh, st stimulates dopamine in the same way that uh, other uh, certain even drugs of abuse like cocaine would stimulate dopamine. It also uh, bombards the nucleus accumbens and gives you that rush that people will describe who are, who are gamers. Um, and, and what it does is it raises the bar at which the brain experiences pleasure. So that when you've been gaming for six hours, getting to the next level, getting skins and those kinds of things, <laughs> right? You young people know about it more than me. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rush, right? It's, you, you feel quite invigorated by it. And then when your mother and father want you to go and go for a walk in the park, or just, I don't know, read a novel, it just can't compare because the bar's too high. So we've overstimulated the brain with dopamine, we've bombarded the nucleus accumbens, and nothing else will match except more. More of that gaming, more of that cocaine, more of that wh whatever else it was that we may be coming addicted to. 
And if you think about addiction, you, you know, teenagers get irritated with me when I, when I say that it's addictive because they say, no, well, I'm not addicted to it. But if you look at the key hallmark factors of any addiction uh, and, and you compare it to gaming, you can see the correlation. You need more and more of it. You neglect other areas of your life to pursue it. When you can't have it, you're feeling sad and down. And you can't actually think about or talk about anything else besides it. So, I mean, I think you'll agree that gaming ticks those boxes. And if you need any more evidence, you just have to look at Southeast Asia where they have hundreds of actual rehabilitation clinics for people with gaming addiction. And sometimes kids have to be involuntarily admitted to, to those clinics to actually deal with this addiction. And if we thought gaming was addictive, pornography is even more addictive. And, and so the reason for that is because pornography actually stimulates the brain in a, what we call a polydrug way. In other words, instead of just bombarding the nucleus accumbens with that dopamine effect, what pornography does, there's actually a heroin-like effect. So there's areas in the oh, neuro, neurochemicals in the brain called endorphins, which I'm sure you've all heard of. And there are healthy ways to release one's endorphins, like exercise, for example. But there are also unhealthy ways to overstimulate one's endorphins, pornography being one of them. And so you have this double whammy. You've got the dopamine effect, you've got the endorphin effect, and it's a highly explosively addictive activity. And, and because of the effect of those neurochemicals, you get something called tolerance, which basically means you need more and more of it to achieve the same effect. And that's the, as many of you will know, one of the big dangers of pornography is that it starts somewhere, and because of this tolerance effect, you, you, you crave more and more depraved um, stimulation in pornography to, to, to feel good, to get, that, to get that euphoric feeling. And so um, if we think about the impact of screen addiction in, in our society today, we have to think about it as one of the key areas that, that we're concerned about is, is that of pornography. And of course, because of how ubiquitous screens are in our lives, it's possible to get accidental exposure to pornography. So you can have a child who's just on YouTube or, or playing a, a game that's not age restricted in any way, and you can get these random pop-ups that can then expose them quite unexpectedly to harmful material. And also in a household, you can have much younger siblings who can be accidentally exposed to pornography that's left open on a screen or they walk into their big brother's room or, or, or whatever the case might be. Uh, now, I'm sure I'm scaring you all terribly tonight and that's really not the purpose of tonight. The purpose of this first part is kind of to provide information and knowledge. We need to know what's out there and that's why you're here. But I am going to be talking a little bit later about stuff that we can do to, to deal with it. So, but if pornography is a major issue with, with boys mainly, boys, young men, social media is actually often a major issue with the girls. And social media has its own addictive nature. And there's definitely evidence that excessive use of social media uh, is associated with more anxiety, with more depression, and with a greater risk of, of, of peer addiction and cyberbullying. And again, we saw this acutely during the COVID pandemic where sometimes people's only social interaction was through social media. There's, there's actually some interesting research that the more platforms you're on in social media, and the more hours in the day you're on that social media, and the more times you go into your social media, the, the more likely you are to experience depressive and anxiety symptoms um, in relation to it. And there are different reasons why it can be linked to mental health issues. One of the interesting ones is what we call social comparison pressure. As you know, 
social media is very sanitized, isn't it? it everyone puts their best foot forward on social media. It's the, it's the airbrushed version of their, of their lives and themselves. And especially as an impressionable young person, when you see this all the time, it, it, your, your immediate reaction is, well, I don't have that kind of life. I don't look like that. I don't have a boyfriend like that, etc., etc. And so there's this social comparison pressure. There could be a direct impact of the actual screen exposure itself. There's the so-called FOMO, fear of missing out, which we use in a kind of light-hearted kind of way. But for some people, it's a very real source of anxiety. And then, of course, cyberbullying is, is a risk of social media. So we, we're moving on, and, and we're going to get to some more family stuff and family culture stuff. But of course, all of this can impact on families, right? I mean, it, it goes without saying. These days, parents work from home. They bring work home, and it's difficult to find those boundaries between work and your family life. There's less communication. It can, of course, impact on marriages. Uh, adolescents, at the best of times, are often somewhat distant from their parents. And if both they and their parents are behind a screen, it just enhances that adolescent isolation and, and widens the generation gap. So this is a disclaimer. That's a photograph of my own family. Just to show you that I'm also the parent of four digital natives. And um, this is us bonding on holiday. Um, so what I'm saying to you is I don't have all the answers. I'm also working this out as I go along. Uh, and it calls for a lot of wisdom and a lot of prayer and a lot of communication with your spouse if, you, if you're in a two-parent two home. Uh, and indeed, communication with your children. Um, now, I've gone right. Now, before I even talk about any guidelines, let me just say that the most important thing you can do is pray. Because this calls for a lot of wisdom. You can read all the textbooks. You can come to a talk. Um, you can even be a child psychiatrist. And you still don't know what to do sometimes in your home with, with this. Because it's kind of changing all the time, right? I mean, this whole digital revolution is in a state of flux. Then COVID came and it, everything got multiplied. So as in everything to do with parenting, we, we, we pray and we are promised in the book of James that if we lack wisdom, right, that's me, then we can ask for it. And God's not going to find fault. He will generously give us the wisdom that we, that we need. Um, so what does the American Academy of Pediatrics say? There are a few guidelines on, on this, and I find this one quite helpful. Um, so, as you can imagine, up to the age of 18 months, zero, right? The brain is, is rapidly uh, developing, attachment is happening, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, language. We don't want to interfere with that process in a small child, so zero. From 18 months to five years, what the um, guidelines are is that we're allowed 30 to 60 minutes a day shared use. That's not just plonking your infant in front of an iPad as a babysitter. It's deciding that, okay, we're going to watch. When our kids were small, we watched Barney. <laughs> Barney, and, and you watched it, and then there was actions, and then you had to go and fetch a pink thing from your room and bring it back. So it was, quite col it was quite interactive. It was quite motoric. It wasn't just passively consuming a screen. But the point is you were sitting with your child. You weren't just using it as a babysitter. And interestingly, after the age of five, it's not like there's strict rules. Because parents often ask me in practice of, of their, let's say their nine-year-old or their 10-year-old, how much screen time is, is OK? Well, it, it's not really a good question to ask in a way, because it's more about, let's prioritize healthy stuff first. And, and the guidelines will say, well, let's sit down with you and say, well, how many hours do you need to sleep? Okay, you're at school, you've got extra murals, you've got to exercise, you've got to do homework, you're going to have a family meal together. And then once you've done all of that, how much time is actually left for screen time? Um, and then, okay, with what's left, we'll say, we'll, we'll, 
you can watch some YouTube or, or whatever it might be. Rather than having this somewhat arbitrary stipulation that you can't have more than three hours of screen time per day. Uh, some guidelines around, we're going to talk about meal times, but meal times are very important. Parents, parents, so this is guidelines for parents, put their phones on do not disturb and don't look at your emails and and there's, there is evidence that when phones or screens are involved, there's less interaction with your, your children and often uh, less positive interactions as well. So we have to lead by example. And I think that's very important because we can't expect a standard of behavior in our children beyond which we ourselves have attained. So we need to decide early on. And that's why it's so important to talk to young families about this, um, to decide early on, what are your priorities as a family? How are, you gonna, how are you gonna go about things? What is the family culture you wish to create? And I don't think it's ever too late to be talking about that, but I think the earlier on in your family's life you do it, the better. Uh, and we need to model this to our children from the beginning. They need to see that we're more interested in them than what's going on in face on, on our Facebook or, or, or whatever. If we work from home, we have to have a very clear separation between work and home. And that might be a geographic separation. In other words, work happens there, but not there. It might be a time separation. But we do need to be strict with ourselves as parents around those boundaries. Bedrooms are very, very important to be thinking about when it comes to limiting electronics. There's less parental control, there's increased risk of inappropriate content, including pornography, including cyberbullying. We know about the impact of electronic screens on sleep. And there's some research that children with TVs in their rooms, I remember when I was at school, <coughs> it, was, um, it was like a real status symbol to have a TV in your room. But kids with TVs in their rooms do worse, and they're 30% more likely to be obese. Dinner times are, are another important time to monitor screens. No screens at the dinner table. Allow for conversations and connection to happen. And then this is very important. It's a forum to discuss what's happening in the news. We saw this in COVID, is that kids got extremely anxious because they were bombarded daily by how many new COVID cases there were, how many deaths there were, and families weren't processing it at the dinner table because everyone was either working from home or on their device. And so kids, get, kids got highly anxious. And there's, a, a, there's actually an association, the, the more knowledge of current affairs children have, the, the more anxious they actually get, unless, they've got a proper forum to process it and discuss it. And that forum is the dinner table with their parents. Of course, it encourages a sense of routine. And there is good research that children who have one meal a day around the table with their families have better outcomes. They do better socially. They do better academically. They do better emotionally. And you can argue why that might be. But that connection with their parents, that family cohesion, must be one of the reasons. Car rides, use them. Talk, listen to the radio, pray. But I have a rule, and I don't always stick to it, I suppose. But when I take my son to school, I'm not a taxi. He's not just going to be on his phone while we're driving to school. We can, we can listen to something. We can talk about something. We can, we can pray. But it's not a, a time to just passively engage in screens. Use screen time as an incentive and as a consequence. Given that electronics are part of our lives and part of our children's lives, I think we need to use them wisely and, and use them as both an incentive and a consequence. They, they, screens is, m must be allowed only after chores and homework and all the necessary things have been done. And it shouldn't, I don't believe, be first thing in the morning, even on weekends. Other stuff needs to happen first. Because as soon as that child goes on to fortnight, you can kiss everything else goodbye. 
because of that thing I was talking about, it's preconditioning the brain to expect a certain level of stimulation that other activities won't give it. If you have a time limit on gaming or screen time, set a timer because your child's not going to, you need to, and also use a five minute warning. It's probably only reasonable that uh, if that child's in the middle of a game, they know that they've actually only got five more minutes or 10 more minutes, rather than you rushing into the room and unplugging the Wi-Fi, because that's likely to end badly. <laughs> a smartphone is a privilege, not a right. I strongly believe that, even in 2023. <laughs> um, we, we had a rule, and our children complained bitterly, but none of them were allowed smartphones before they turned 13. It got more and more difficult the younger, <laughs> with the younger, with the last one, it was almost impossible. But um, I think that um, it's a, it takes a level of responsibility to manage a smartphone, and I don't think an average eight or nine-year-old can. Um, but whatever your policy on that as a parent, you, you can't just give it to them and hand it over to them. You need to be monitoring that thing. Random spot checks is appropriate, at least up into a certain age. Um, but, but don't be a helicopter parent. I mean, they do have their own lives. You don't need to be privy to every single conversation. Quite frankly, it's dead boring anyway. <laughs> you, you're really there to just check if there's really bad, inappropriate stuff and all bad language, whatever, you know, and their rules. And I think if your child's on social media, it's appropriate that you follow them. Um, that's, should, I think, should be a reasonable uh, rule. And of course, resist the pressure of the rest of your child's peer group, because it was like that with us. With every single one of them, we were apparently the only parent in the class who wouldn't give their child a smartphone. But I'm sure all their friends said exactly the same thing to their parents. We need to teach our children digital etiquette. Right? This is very important. And I'll just plug this book, Selfies, Sex, and Smartphones. I do have a slide at the end with resources, but it's written by a South African by the name of Emma Sadlier. And it's a very practical book that's actually written for kids to read themselves around how to be safe in the online world. Right? Text doesn't con convey tone of voice. And it's, they need to be taught this. There are things that we can intuitively get when we're just having a conversation that that text is not going to convey. Photos last forever, finished. You can never delete it. You have a digital footprint. If you post something online, it's there. Don't think it's ever going to go away. Watch your language. Only have contacts who you've met face to face. And this, I believe, is very important. In a group chat, if there's bullying, either you call it, you stand up for someone who's being bullied, or you leave the chat. Because otherwise, you're complicit. It's not going to say, well, I had nothing to do with it. You're on the chat. You're, you, uh, you need to act. And so, I, and I think the same would go for adults. But children need to be taught this. And then we're moving towards the end now, and we'll have some time for questions. But use the village. You, you, you know the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think in this area, as in so many other areas of parenting, it's very true. So talk to your spouse. Talk to other parents. Enroll your child in other healthy activities. I think holidays are very important because, especially the long ones, most parents have to work. And what happens? We end up just leaving our children to their, to their devices. And so I think we need to be intentional about how kids uh, spend their holidays. And so we need to think about developmentally healthy ways for them to be engaged. Enlist the help of, the, of your family, of grandparents and other family members. I found um, with my parents, often they just needed to be asked. You, you know, they wouldn't necessarily volunteer to take my child to the park. But if I asked them to, you know, then they would. Um, if you have home help, be intentional about the role you want your home help to play. Because sometimes your, your domestic worker might just feel like they've just got to get all the, get the house clean, do the ironing and, and, and all of that. But 
and, and leave the kids to be in front of the iPad. But maybe that's different. Maybe the, the, the housework is not that important and they can also be more interactive with your children while you're at work. And use available resources. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to go through this whole list, um, but, but, but uh, I mean, Paul, my slides are available for anyone, so I'm quite happy to... But, but I'll, I'll just put, make another plug. This is for this book uh, by, by the name of Digital Cocaine. It's written by somebody called Brad Huddleston. And it explains very powerfully the addictive nature of, of screen use, especially gaming. Um, anyway, there, there, there's a few. That media use plan, about halfway down, that's very helpful. That's on the, uh, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics. One of their, 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 their sub-sites is called healthychildren.org. And you can actually download a media use plan that you can modify for your family. Um, uh, which, which can then be almost, a, a, if you like, a contract that your family adheres to when it comes to screen use. Um, right, and I'm going to leave you, and, and this might be the most important thing I say to you tonight, and that is as parents we need to relax. Because so much of our parenting in this day and age is driven by fear and anxiety. And, that, and that's my... My prayer, uh, apart from anything else, and what I've shared with you this evening, is that you don't leave here just afraid, because then I don't think I've done my job. I want you to be equipped with knowledge, but I don't want you to be petrified. Um, it's one of my favorite parenting scriptures, in that from 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so in this area, as in I think any other area of parenting, we need to be a little bit more proactive and a little bit less reactive. So that means actually showing an interest in your child's online world, not just parceling it off and banning it, but there's an aspect of it, there's an element of it that's okay and, and even good right? And indeed, that's going to be part of their lives growing up more so than it ever was in ours. And so engage them with it. Talk to them about it. Be interested in it if you possibly can. I mean, really, fortnight. <laughs> I, I couldn't get that right. But there are other areas that you maybe could. Um, focus our attention on the good stuff, right? Again, so let's develop an appetite in our children for healthy exercise for nature. Go camping. Um, you, you know, read a, read a book together. Um, expose them to, to different extramurals, to the arts. Go to a museum. It, it, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it does mean we have to be proactive and, and thinking, and thinking of, of, of these various activities. And lastly, remember that you were once a teenager yourself. I, often have to remind myself of this. Not, of course, that I had an iPad when I was young, because it w wasn't a thing. But I was a teenager, which means I challenged my parents, I knew better than my parents, I gave them a hard time. And so don't be surprised when your children do that to you, because that's what teenagers do. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions.